I want to thank everybody for joining us at Maisel's Documentary Center virtually for this Paper Children Q&A. My name is Allison Lights, and I'm the theater manager and a programmer here at the cinema. Normally, we screen documentaries all year round and have education programs for youth in Harlem and the South Bronx. Obviously, right now we're virtual, but our education programs and cinema, as you've probably seen if you're here, have been able to continue virtually, which we're incredibly grateful for. We've got a lot of virtual screenings planned and coming up this week. Uh, this coming week, we have Ella Fitzgerald, Just One of Those Things. It's a new doc coming that will be screening for free on June 19th, Juneteenth with a live Q&A that um, is in partnership with the National Jazz Museum in Harlem, which we're very excited for. Um, and the film will start running in our cinema virtually on June 26th. Uh, for more information about these films, and others that are available, please, please, please check out mazels.org and remember to sign up for our newsletter while you're there for more updates. We can't wait to have you back in the cinema with us, but in the meantime, we are always incredibly grateful for your support. Today, I've got a wonderful array of panelists with us. We've got Alexandra Codina, otherwise known as Ali. Um, Alexandra's debut film, Monica and David, tells the story of two adults with Down syndrome. The film won Tribeca's Film Festival Jury Award, was nominated for an Emmy Award, premiered on HBO and broadcast in 33 countries. Paper Children, which is the film we're here for today, is a YouTube Originals release coming soon on June 25th about four siblings who fled gang violence in Honduras. It's her second feature documentary as a director and producer. She's currently producing also untitled Chinese in Africa project with Jialing Zhang, who's the producer and director of One Child Nation. Susan Margolin is our other panelist. She's a producer and for over three decades has built a reputation as a pioneer of digital distribution and a dedicated supporter and creator of independent films. She co-founded New Video and Docurama and currently in 2016, she launched St. Mark's Productions and has worked on a number of projects, including Paper Children. Fernando is also here. He's the lead in our film, Paper Children. He, at 17 years old, brought his younger siblings to safety in the US and was born and raised in Honduras, but now is living in the US. He works in home renovations and continues to play a central role in his nuclear family. We also have Gracia Cozy. I'm sorry if I just mispronounced your last name, you'll have to correct me. Um, she's a supervising attorney at Catholic Legal Services, Archdiocese of Miami, and the lawyer for the family featured in Paper Children. She joined um, the Catholic Legal Services in 2014. So I want to, well, before I begin fully, I want to disclose that I have worked with Susan and Allie in the past um, via St. Mark's Productions as well. So I have a little bit of a um, double hand in this particular production, um, but it's been wonderful to work with you all. And I'm so glad to have you here with us at Maisel's, even if Thank it's you, virtually. Allie. Thank you. We're happy to be here too. Yeah, good. Um, Allie, to start us off, I'm wondering if you could give us a little background on how you found this story and what drew you to it. So in 2014, I read a report about a large influx of children who were arriving from Central America fleeing violence in the region. And at the time, I was very struck that the reaction seemed to be um, concern over border security and se concerns over national security as opposed to concern about the children. And, um, you know, I was reading a lot of advocates talking about how this was such a significant humanitarian moment and all of, and why it was that these kids were fleeing. And when I started reading more of those anecdotal um, stories of what particular children had been pushed out by, you know, specifically the gang violence, I was very drawn as, as the mother of young children and, you know, just, just basically appalled on the human side that this is the way we were going to respect these kids. Um, and, and yeah, I just started researching and I started visiting with different legal organizations that I know that work with immigrants and started observing an immigration court and started absorbing as much information as I could. And then I actually about, I don't know, nine, 10 months, maybe a year into the research, I 
met with Croatia and she introduced me to Fernando and his family. So I was gonna ask how you came upon their family, but it sounds like it was through a um, through Gracia. Yes. Did you Gracia, did you just were they one of your clients and you just met them that way? So in 2014, as Ali had said, there was, you know, the surge of children coming to the southern border and our office was taking as many cases that we could take. Um, and I had taken this family's case and um, Ali had come to our office and she was sort of interested in looking for, for, you know, interesting cases, but also it's very hard to share, you know, with our clients, like we're trying to protect them. Um, and their stories can be so powerful and also there could be many bad repercussions for them, you know, having a, a story publicly shared. So I had to think a lot about, you know, if I wanted to, to put Ali in touch with any of my clients and which family would be appropriate. Um, and I knew that this family was appropriate for this type of, um, you know, project. And so I made the introduction and from there it was, you know, up to the family to decide how much they wanted to be involved in this. Susan, do you want to tell us a little bit about how you got involved in the project? Sure. So, um, Allie and I had worked together um, when she made Monica and David. Uh, my company did the uh, DVD and uh, then digital distribution outside of HBO. And, uh, you know, I was just um, so um, impressed by her and her commitment to the story and to the telling of Monica and David's story. And when she um, approached me about becoming involved in, um, in this project, uh, I jumped at the chance. So, um, you know, it's been an amazing, um, you know, I guess a little bit more than three years since we, um, since we, you know, uh, met and started uh, talking about uh, becoming involved. It's been an incredible journey. <laughs> Ali, do you think you could tell us a little bit more about um, why you chose to tell the story of uh, the, as you put it in the synopsis, invisible refugee crisis through a personal lens rather than a sort of, there's so many ways to tell the story. <laughs> why yeah. did you choose to do it through a personal yeah. family? Absolutely, and if it's okay, I'm gonna first interject and make sure. Fernando, ves bien la traducción que lo está Fran lo está haciendo en vivo y en el chat, ¿lo ves? Sí, sí, lo estoy bien. Okay. Um, we're doing for anyone who who's curious, we're doing the live chat translation. Uh, if, so Fernando understands everything that we're discussing and any questions that come up. But why a very human lens rather than, for example, a political one, um, which was. It's a great question and it's a big part of what drove the making of this film because when I started reading about what was happening, well, I think one of the most interesting things was not only reading a lot of the articles when we had the, the surge um, of children who were arriving in 2014, it was also the comments. So I started as part of the research trying to understand what was happening, why it was happening, but also what the reaction was. And so I really started, I felt, okay, people aren't seeing them as children. People are still just seeing this and, you know, from a statistical political perspective um, is it was highly politicized by design and notably, and this was during the Obama administration, you know, I think we just have this deep legacy within our country of really, really not knowing how to deal with immigration. It's just something that has been, and desperate need of reform and attention for a very long time. And for me, again, being, being not only, you know, a new mom at the time, but also being the daughter of an unaccompanied child who arrived, had arrived from Cuba in the 60s as part of the last big wave of unaccompanied children. There were 17,000 kids who arrived from Cuba in the 60s, a program called Operation Peter Pan. So for me, when the, and that's how my father arrived in this country. But my father had had a very different reception. I mean, it was, it's funny, when he first met Fernando, 
they had a very emotional bond between the two of them. And the first thing my father said to him was, I would have traded being with my family for, you know, my legal status, right? And so for him, that was his experience as a young person arriving here without his family. In the case of Fernando and his three siblings, Chena, John, and Mauricio, they were really blessed to be able to reunite with their parents here in Miami. Um, but when I just thought about this, this the way that, um, you know, my, my father and, and, and any child who arrived as an unaccompanied child in our past history and was received at least with open arms from a legal perspective and from an asylum perspective, which is what happened with um, younger Cuban refugees until recently, you know, it's hard to judge, right? What, it's like, where do you begin? What does a child most need when they're in desperate need of protection? Of course, they, they really need their family, but they also need to be safe. And, you know, he received a very different treatment simply because of the diplomatic relations and, and the way that um, Cuba had been designated um, as a communist country and, and because of politics. And because of politics, these other children who were fleeing frankly, even more horrific circumstances of gang violence were being shut out. Um, so I, I was just really interested because I thought if people could really see past the politics and really see this through the eyes of children and through the eyes of young people who truly are vulnerable and not, not a security threat and not a danger to our society. Um, I think when you start considering children, it's a lot harder for anyone in any position in the world to really not feel something emotional. And that was the, that's the bottom line, right, was to get to a more emotional and human experience in watching this story rather than leaning into the politics and the statistics. Um, speaking of politics, Gracia, you've been uh, working in the field since 2014. And my understanding is that when Trump took power in 2017, he pretty drastically changed that asylum and interview process. Could you give us a little insight into how his actions have changed what you're doing? Yeah, there have definitely been huge shifts in immigration policy um, since the Trump administration took over. Um, I think that one thing that's very confusing is that immigration court is actually, um, it's part of the executive branch. So it's always been very susceptible to influence from the executive branch, but we've never seen anything to this extent. Um, so major, you know, immigration lawyers have worked hard um, to have cases before the Board of Immigration Appeals and to build case law and positive case law in terms of helping, um, you know, certain types of relief for, for under asylum. Asylum is a very complicated area of the law, um, but we'll just say that there was a lot of work that was undone very quickly by the Trump administration because they had the power um, to sort of circumvent what I think most people would assume would be a normal process of changing the laws, mm -hmm. um, like going through Congress. So mm -hmm. instead, we sort of, the Attorney General has a lot of power over, um, you know, the immigration judges and the immigration judges and the Department of Homeland Security. Um, you know, they're working together, um, you know, in a sense, and it's very, very challenging for immigration lawyers. Um, you know, there are other forms of relief, and it's not just asylum, but uh, very, like, very much so everything has changed with the Trump administration. It's become unduly difficult for anyone, even if you're, um, you know, you're trying to get benefits through USCIS um, for a different reason. It's sort of like a very complicated system right now. Um. I'm wondering if one of you could speak to sort of the way in which the you wanted to deal with like the secondary trauma and all of that that they were ostensibly going through that many people young people who come on these journeys like how that was dealt with in the film I know that that's a big kind of relatively unspoken issue of like a lot of people coming and really dealing with a lot of intense things that they've dealt with in the past I'm wondering if anybody wants to kind of discuss how that was dealt with, maybe Allie? 
Could we loop Fernando into the question? Because sure. I feel that um, Fernando Allison está preguntando sobre un poco la trauma, o sea, el camino es difícil, toda esta experiencia es difícil, pero luego que la gente no considera como que el otro nivel, la, la, la trauma, la, el aspecto emocional de, de la experiencia de llegar acá. You mean, you mean the, like the combination, the combination of what was experienced back home and the journey? Yeah, yeah, and the journey together. El aspecto emocional que la gente no siempre, cuando uno solo ve la política y la estadística, no están considerando la, el aspecto, el peso emocional de lo que uno ha sobrevivido en Honduras o Centroamérica y luego para llegar a este país. ¿Te parece hablar un poco de este tema? Lo que uno pasa, lo que uno pasa, el trayecto de venir para acá. El aspecto emocional y también de allá en Centroamérica. Mm. And maybe, um, sorry to interrupt, but uh, Fran, if you want to put your video back on, then you could do a translation of what he's saying. This is our translator. <laughs> Sorry, hi. Fernando, perdón. Mm -hmm. Que nos quieres hablar un poco de, de estas ideas? Por ejemplo, el camino, ¿qué tal fue el camino? Bueno, lo, como, como dice usted, hay mucha gente que no sabe lo que uno pasa para, para poder estar aquí. Porque mucha gente solo tú lo piensa que uno viene y viene, pero no sabe todo lo que uno pasa para poder estar en este país. Todas las, uh, las emociones fuertes que tiene uno y lo que mira por todo el camino. Como, como, como ver las luces y, y como tipo cementerio, lo que pasa a uno cuando los inmigrantes este, mueren ahí, solo mira las luces y a veces mira cosas muy extrañas. Se siente la presencia cuando uno va pasando por ahí, que son, son, son partes que son muy peligrosas. Desde, un, desde que uno sale de, de, de Honduras, ya viene con, esa, con, con ese pensamiento que le va a pasar a uno por todo ese camino. Porque todas las historias que se han escuchado, cuando, uno, cuando las otras personas vienen para acá, se escuchan muchas historias de lo que pasa en el camino. Sobre todo lo, lo, los mareros, sobre todo lo, las maras que hay ahí asaltando a toda la gente, las personas que violan, que matan, que, que roban. Y a veces no solo roban, que las violan a las muchachas. Y, uh, y, esa, y ese temor lo traía desde allá de Honduras cuando venía con mi hermana, porque era la única hembra que venía entre nosotros. Y además venía mi hermano pequeño también, que viene con ese pensamiento uno que, que va a pasar y que va a pasar. Siempre viene con, con, con un temor por todo ese camino y todo, esa, todo eso que pasa a uno, la gente de aquí este, no lo sabe. Solo dicen que uno viene y viene, pero no saben todo lo que un, todo el esfuerzo, lo que todo el esfuerzo que tiene que pasar uno para poder llegar aquí, las emociones que uno pasa. Y eso creo que nunca se olvidan como las cosas que pasaron en mi país. Son cosas que siempre están en mi mente, siempre se recuerdan y a veces siempre uno sueña. Son experiencias muy fuertes sobre bueno que uno todo el camino viene pasando cosas. Que, que, que uno se sorprende cada vez que van, van pasando cosas porque siempre son, son, son emociones fuertes que uno le pasa por todo el camino. Desde que uno sale, viene viviendo experiencias muy, muy fuertes. Ok. Um, so, Fernando is saying that lots of people here have no idea what you as an immigrant go through to get here. Um, people aren't aware of the emotional baggage and things that you experience along the way. Um, when you are on your way here, you see all these lights and it's really scary. Sometimes it looks like a cemetery and uh, you think of death a lot. Um, a lot of places that you go through on your way here are really dangerous. So the stress and the fear that you carry is really huge. Uh, you hear stories about what happens to other folks who are also trying to come here, um, other folks from Honduras. Uh, you hear stories about robberies, rapes, kidnappings, and killings. And that makes you very afraid and stressed. Um, he, Fernando, was traveling with his younger brother and sister, so he had a lot of fear for them based off of the stories that he heard um, and for their safety. Um, so people here just say that immigrants are just coming and coming nonstop and 
they never really stop to think about what we as migrants go through to get here, what we fled from in our country and what we had to do along the way. I have another question for you, Fernando. Um, I'm wondering how you're feeling about this film and the story going out on YouTube and being available to so many people. ¿Cómo te sientes al respecto de la película y que se esté proyectando a través de Mesos y de YouTube y que lo vea tanta gente? Oh, bueno, son, es algo, es una experiencia muy linda la que, la que estoy pasando. Bueno, mi familia y, mí, y yo también. Son cosas que, que uno nunca se va a imaginar que van a pasar y, y que todo es para bien. Son cosas maravillosas y son muy lindas. Para mí es una experiencia... Creo que nunca lo voy a olvidar y, y es súper emocionante todo. Um, it's a wonderful experience for both me and my family. You never imagine so many people uh, seeing this movie and it's an experience that is very beautiful and one that I will never forget. Gracias, Fernando. <laughs> We can't hear you, Allison. Sorry, I have street noise, so I've been trying to mute it. <laughs> um, Gracia, I'm wondering if you can, um, I've been sort of hearing that it, it's, it, it seems like there's sort of hit keywords or phrases when you're going through the asylum process or just any process of getting in here that people need to hit, hit in order to sort of move forward through that system. I'm wondering what your experience of that has been and how you've sort of had to deal with that or if you could speak to that a bit. Um, do you mean like the process for my clients? Like how they're, the different steps that they take to get to immigration court? Yeah, or, and and your experience of like having, like is it a, a thing that you need to coach people through or is it sort of? Okay, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, well, what happens, I mean, just so that everyone has an understanding is that um, previously, before COVID, <laughs> before some other very significant changes at the border, um, children that were arriving unaccompanied were put into um, an Office of Refugee Resettlement Shelter. And there, they were also given legal services and other, you know, psychosocial services. And then they were released, hopefully, to a parent if they had a parent in the United States or to an immediate family member um, or to a sponsor, anybody that was willing to come forward for them, right? So children were automatically put in deportation proceedings the minute they entered the United States. They were put in a shelter. They were put in deportation proceedings. Um, and then they were hopefully released to somebody that could take good care of them. Um, and then and my office would step in because we have a big presence in the immigration court and we're doing intakes and screenings of like, actually like thousands of children. Um, and, and so from there, they're in deportation proceedings there before the judge. Um, but there's also this side process where you can have an asylum interview because of these special protections that are in place for children. Um, so I know the film sort of touches upon that, that, you know, we're outside the asylum office with John um, and that the younger three siblings, you know, they, they were granted asylum at the asylum office. Um, and from there, if you're not at, granted at the asylum office level, your case would be referred back to the immigration court. So I know I'm getting into the nuances. <laughs> of it all but um but basically that would be you know the process of trying to for children they were supposed to everybody was supposed to be given the opportunity to give their to share their story and to move on for adults they have to pass what what's called credible fear or reasonable fear at the border which right now nobody is being admitted into the united states so uh, you know, I'm trying to, it, so much has changed. I know you, you know, you asked me before about what's going on at the border and how things have changed. Um, but there's, you know, there's this, there's this process called um, the migrant protection protocol where basically migrants are trapped in Mexico and they have a date where they can even go to the United States to go to the border to present themselves before they're even admitted to try to get to the next step of 
um, of asking for asylum. So there's many obstacles right now for anyone trying to enter the United States. Luckily, children have special protection. And at the time that he entered with his siblings, those protections were being honored. And they were able to, you know, get released quickly from the shelter and be reunited with their family. Um, and from there, yeah, we're still in the immigration court process. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah. Process it's a continues. very long process. And yeah. there are right now 12,000 children who are without an attorney unrepresented in the deportation process at the court. Well, 12,000 is just Miami, right? Just in Miami. Yeah. Just in Miami. I forget the national statistic, but it's pretty unbelievable the number of kids that go to court without legal representation. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's wild. Is there, speaking of that, is there a way that people who are watching this right now that they can be helpful or <laughs> promote yeah. that, that from your various perspectives to yeah. obviously help this move forward as a... I think that, you know, one of the biggest ways to help um, you know, aside from just kind of following what's happening within kind of your state and um, how your own state government um, is voting around the issue of immigration. And right now there's frankly no, there aren't any bills that are pending. There's no reform on the horizon. Um, right now it's kind of in triage mode. And I think the place where it's most helpful is to support pro bono legal agencies like Catholic Legal Services who represent um, Fernando and his siblings and they, along with another organization here in Miami uh, called Americans for Immigrant Justice, they represent, they pretty much are the pro bono representation for all of South Florida. So, you know, given the fact, I think very few people, and Gracia was touching on this before, we, because it's not a freestanding court system, the immigration courts, you don't have the right to a public defender. So even if you're a four-year-old, and you have to appear in front of an immigration judge, you don't have the right to an attorney. Um, you have the right to find your own attorney, but you know what child or young person who just fled Central America has those resources? So, uh, and that's true for family units as well or, or adults, but certainly with minors and with kids, it's especially alarming because as Gracia was saying, immigration law is considered alongside tax law, the two most complex um, fields of law in the United States. And it's ever changing. Just in the last few years, there have been, last I heard it was over 400 something changes to immigration law. Um, since Trump took office, I don't even know if we've surpassed 500 at this point, but it's very hard to keep up. It, under normal circumstances, it's very hard to keep up. So obviously without a lawyer, it would be impossible. So it's, it's great that you asked. And I think by far the best thing people can do is really donate to a pro bono legal agency. As I said, down here, you know, we're really proud of, it's been great collaborating on this one with Catholic Legal Services and up in New York, New Jersey, um, Connecticut. One really wonderful national partner is KIND, Kids in Need of Defense. I can put these in the chat, but they, um, they train and supply lawyers all over the country. But every community has their own pro bono legal group that's, that's helping their local community. Yeah, it definitely helps to have more funding because the funding goes directly to hiring attorneys who can then take on a whole caseload and help, you know, if they can take on 60 to 75 cases, we have the need. I mean, we screen thousands of children and we have to triage them and we have to sort of figure out, you know, how we can help as many people as possible with very limited resources. But there are a lot of young attorneys that want to do this work. Um, we just need to give them a paycheck. Yes. <laughs> and I think there are a lot of great, you know, older, you know, established attorneys that have come to us to do pro bono work as well. So it's another part of our organization is um, mentoring pro bono attorneys. You know, we are just trying to utilize our resources the best we can. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. Any updates on the family before we go? Fernando, alguna, algunas novedades de tu familia? De ti, algunas noticias? Eh, bueno, el trabajo, la, yo sé que también no solo tú, pero todos tus hermanos 
eh, no sé, cuenta tú lo que quieras y también a través de ellos yo también tengo novedades de todos. Bueno, he estado hablando con mi mami y he estado un poco mal, pero solo fue algo pasajero. Pero yo, pues, mi trabajo está un poco, poco raro porque como ha estado en las lluvias y el trabajo que tengo solo es por afuera, porque como las personas no quieren dar trabajo por adentro, solo dan trabajo por afuera y ahorita han comenzado las lluvias, casi no estaba trabajando. A veces solo son ratos que ha estado trabajando y ahí solo paso hablando con mami, con mi mami no trabaja, ella paso hablando con ella para ver cómo sigue, pero ella sigue mejor de todo lo que, lo que tenía. Um, Fernando is saying that um, his mother is doing better and that she had not been doing so well recently. Um, that folks back home are struggling because there has been a lot of rain, so there has not been a lot of work, um, which, you know, has everyone at home and you know, a little stressed and not being able to uh, be employed. Y entonces, en términos, de, voy a contar en inglés, está bien un poco más de lo que se de China y Mauricio y... Uh, so his other siblings, Mauricio, who's the middle brother, has actually um, been working, has been learning a fair amount of English at work, um, kind of on the job site. Uh, everyone in the family is doing day labor work, so it depends on um, when the work is available. And Jan is in school, he's um, thriving, he's probably the one who's obviously learned the more, most English because he's been in school full time until um, recently with summer and then all the COVID upheaval. And um, that everyone is healthy. No one, you know, thank God everybody's been healthy. Um, China is doing fabulous. China has really been focusing a lot on self-care in the last year. Um, I, I've, I personally have seen the biggest transformation with her. And I think a lot of it has to do, it's interesting, like while we were filming, um, you know, she was still in that same limbo, which we can ask Fernando about now. Um, which it's, you know, I've really observed the emotional weight. You were asking before Alex, the trauma of the past and the trauma of the journey. But really, you know, there's a whole other layer which is going through this process and what that does to just be in permanent limbo. And I found it really interesting during COVID times that I feel like we're all getting a small taste of what that's like to really, truly, completely have life on pause and really not know um, kind of, if you're going to have a leg to stand on tomorrow. And, you know, I think that's just, and I've seen the difference. So, you know, Jan has flourished, Mauricio has flourished, and Sheena was the last one that I've really seen undergo a beautiful metamorphosis. Um, metamorphosis. She's working a lot. And um, like I said, just really focusing on herself. Like she's just really healthy right now. And, um, and I have seen a really strong corollary between watching a young person go from that point of not knowing kind of if at any moment they're going to be deported and separated from their family and then having that certainty and finally being able to focus on their future here, um, which I think is a really interesting thing with, porque Fernando con tu familia, yo he observado para China, Mauricio, Jan, ellos han podido como que comenzar de nuevo acá y como que ya han tenido más han podido tomar más pasos porque ya tienen esa protección, ya tienen ese alivio, no tienen ese estrés de que si, de que si les van a deportar, de que, ¿cómo estás tú en estos días con ese estrés? Bueno, yo siempre, como le digo, siempre paso con el miedo de que no sé lo que va a pasar. Porque, ah, como no se aclara nada, según toda la todo lo que está pasando con el presidente, no se aclara nada lo que va a pasar y no estoy seguro qué es lo que va a pasar. Siempre paso con el estrés que si me mandan, para dónde me voy a ir, si mi familia está aquí ya. Pero también le doy gracias a Dios porque ya mis hermanos también, ellos están, como dice usted, ellos se quitaron todo el estrés, ellos pasan tranquilos, siguen la vida de ellos. No pasan con el estrés de que van a deportar o me va a pasar esto, me va a pasar aquello, no, ellos ya están... Ya se quitaron ese dolor de cabeza de estar pensando de que, de que no le van a dar papeles, ya ellos lo tienen, ellos están tranquilos. Ellos siguen su vida sin pensar nada, nada más, nada de eso. A cambio yo, yo paso pensando qué es lo que va a pasar. Okay, Fernando is saying that 
yes, he's always stressed about what could happen to us here. Nothing is clear regarding Trump and the politics and all the changes happening. You never know where you could be sent or if you'll be taken away. Um, but he's very glad and relieved that his siblings no longer have that fear and have received protective state and asylum. Um, so that makes him feel safe and relieved. Um, but for himself, there's still that stress and that constant concern looming over him. Yeah, if I can add something, I mean, I think we had talked earlier a little bit about the process of going through, of, you know, how to get to the next step. And um, in all parts of immigration, uh, the most important factor is your credibility. So if you are not perceived as credible, um, then you never make it to the next step, right? So credibility is the foundation of immigration practice. And that puts a huge amount of pressure on traumatized children. I don't think that any of us could actually tell our stories and share our own traumas in a perfect, eloquent way <laughs> um, in order to be granted the protections and the the sort of the bar is so high because sort of credibility can be used against you at any time. So one of my jobs, part of my job that I find very challenging working with this population is that I have to work with them to, for them to trust me and to build them up so that they will tell me their story fully so that I can look for any crack and I can sort of address it head on and try to figure out because obviously when you have this much trauma, you're, your recollection is different of events and representing families is even more complicated because every child has had their own experience living in the same place. And then once I have their trust, I have to break them down and I have to play, you know, bad cop. I have to play the government so that they understand the kind of questions that they're going to be asked and so that they know how to respond to those questions. And it's so painful. It's so painful for, you know, it's painful for the attorneys, it's painful for our clients. Um, and that's another layer of stress, just for having to relive these traumas over and over again, and then having to be put on the spot and sort of having practice to the type of questions that you might be asked in a trial. Um, but then, you know, you might get off track and there could be a miscommunication or a bad translation of a word. I mean, there's just so many things happening so quickly in the court. And we're asking, you know, for Fernando to present all of the information perfectly. And it's a lot of stress. I know he feels that stress. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah, I think we've seen that again and again in all facets of our <laughs> political system that, I mean, from the Me Too of the movement and all of that, like it's just been like people under stress are under stress and you can't think clearly. <laughs> and exactly. so to like expect um, perfection. Yeah, perfection under stress is just kind of ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, especially like emotional perfection, like or something that's like already hard and you haven't, you know, Right. It's really practiced. Um, good. I think if there was any last questions or things from the audience, if you guys have anything, I'll have one more question um, for on my end, which is more of a sort of wrapping up, but I will um, ask that to you guys. And then if there's any audience questions, you're welcome to throw those into the Q&A box here at the bottom um, of your screen depending on, I guess, how you're accessing it. Um, I guess it's, it's really just if, if there was something that I didn't bring up that you guys wanted to talk about, or if there was something that we started to touch on that you wanted to talk about more, I would wanted to open up the space to you guys and see if there was anything in the panel that you wanted to say. Fernando, ¿hay algo más que quieras contar o que quieras decirle al, al público invisible que no los vemos, pero por ahí están? Bueno, pero lo único que puedo decir es muchísimas gracias por todo el apoyo que me han dado y que me siguen dando. Thank you y for all your support. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, y, y espero que todo se mejore y que todo salga bien. 
So Fernando is saying thank you for all your support and for being here today. And he hopes that things improve and that things are okay. Gracias a ti, por Fernando, por siempre compartir tu historia y estar presente. Y es un honor estar al lado tuyo, aunque físicamente no puede ser en este momento. Pero, pero seguimos. Este es el comienzo. But thank you, Allison, Fran, Gracia, Susan. Thank you guys for coming. I appreciate you guys taking the time. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye. Setting it up, Allison. And thanks, Fran. Thank you, Susan, for being here. <laughs>